so I just um, wanted to read a little bit about the judge, Susan. Um, she was born and raised in Detroit. She got her MFA from the University of Michigan. She got a Stegner Fellowship to Stanford. Her first book, On the Vanishing of Large Creatures, won the John C. Zacharias First Book Award. Um, and she has worked at Autumn House Press and the Poetry Foundation, and she lives in Ann Arbor, like I said. Mm -hmm. She told me that all of the winners were great, and it was sort of hard to decide the order. Um, tonight we're going to go in reverse order from the fifth place to the first place. Um, and the poets are going to do something a little different this time. They're going to read their winning poem, another poem by them, and then they're going to read for National Poetry Month a poem by somebody else. Um, so. Uh, Susan has written a little something about each person's winning poem, so I'm just going to start with Clara Call, and she wrote, a, her winning poem is called For My Sister, and the judge says, For My Sister is a very moving devotional poem which is heartfelt without being sappy or nostalgic. Clara uses some amazing figurative language here, breath like light bulbs beneath ribs, that's a quote from the poem, and also a tremendous amount of sound and internal rhyme to create a powerful poem in both meaning, message, and form. Please welcome Clara. winning poem, and it's called For My Sister. When my parents told me about you, I wanted to name you Cindy Lou Who. This would be you. A small girl with crooked teeth and the kind of eyes that are afraid of the dark. My mother laughed, your laugh, and said, we're thinking about Elena. I spun the name around my tongue, Elena, Elena, said it over and over. I shoved it between the gap in my teeth. I assumed you'd inherit, kept it stored in my cheek tissue, Elena. The first time you kicked, legs buckling against the only barrier keeping you in, mom said you were dancing in her stomach, already can't sit still, already shaking. Everyone looked at me with bright eyes and said, aren't you excited to be an older sister? Someone bought me a shirt with big sisters scrawled in, on it in sparkly pen and a pop-up book about being a good sibling. But they never warned, warned me about this swell of heavy love in my stomach. Sibling love is the hard kind of love no one ever wants to talk about. The kind of love that doesn't ask permission, but it's there. Permanent, painful, warm. When you were born, little screaming seven pounds of you, anxious for the taste of air in your lungs, like there were light bulbs tucked under your ribs. I visited you in the hospital, pressed my nose up close to the nursery window. My father pointed with a proud hand and said, look, there she is. Mom said we had the same nose. I held you for the first time in the Indianapolis Women's Health Center, room 307. They placed your head in the crook of my arm. You stopped crying, looked up at me with smushed eyes, your face a wrinkled grape, your hands impossibly small, your skin hanging off your bones, six hours old. We brought you home and Dad dragged the cradle into the center of the living room. She'll be safe this way. We'll be able to keep an eye on her. I watched as you grew into your extra skin, as the soft spot on your head grew stiff with bone. I was there when you sat up for the first time, smiled and clapped. I let you hold onto my fingers as you practice walking around the living room, your little feet searching for stability, unshakable, strong. I remember when you started talking and never stopped. Your cinnamon voice like the wind chimes hanging from grandma's porch where we ate mango stars, and you taught me how to be an older sister, where we crafted daisy chains using the matching parts of our bones, the supple earth bending underneath of us. I never anticipated this. You, fierce, strong, firecracker, you, loudmouth, split tongue, rebellion, you, every door left open, tap dancing teeth, you, shiny, laugh, shinier heart, you, wicked chump, you, I worry about you. You know that, don't you? Adolescence is kind to very few people, and weird girls who like giraffes with big eyes and dancing alone aren't the favorites. <laughs> this is what I wanted to tell you. I love your round moon face. Your short nails that always have polka dots or ghosts or flowers. I want to tell you that it's okay or it's going to be. That you have something shimmery in your tendons. That you were born coated in shine and you come from solid roots. Remember, you were born during the springtime. I always picked out your socks and tried to hold your feet down as I shoved them on. But you fought back, kicked from the base, fire legs, bold, bold, exclamation mark legs, beautiful legs. Remember, dancing to crocodile rap. Bouncing our hot feet off the ground, not knowing the words, not really caring. Remember that. 
Remember the quiet nights I read you books about mice and tucked you into bed. Remember this. The fire is coming. Fight back. Kick from the base. I love you. Be bold and bold again. Remember. I'm going to do the poem with someone else's next. Um, and this poem is by Carlina Duan, who is a student at the U of M right now, and she's really, really, a really fantastic poet. Um, this is called Girl Scout Cookies. We clutched boxes of them to our stammering chest. Samoas, tagalong, sugar-free chocolate chip, badges nailed into our brown vests, promises of pretty woman we'd one day become. We lost our two front teeth. And when we smile, a crater spluttered through our mouths. Tiny girls, still unsure how to swallow the names of boys down our throats. Tiny girls heaving with dreams of cash and clinking shoes. Straining, we, we, we reached for doorbells and pressed their brass skins. The woman who answered the doors wore maroon lipstick like our mothers, peered down at us at, in scooped necklines. When we raised our boxes above our arms, we wanted them to bless us for the teeth wedged beneath our pillows, filled us cakes with thick, bossy frosting, let us slice and serve. We wanted them to hoist our dreams out hoist our dreams out our bodies like seeds, teaching us the science of their blooming. The women who answered the door shut them quick. When we reached the end of the street, our boxes stacked hilly in our arms. It was the first time we would ask and they would shut. We didn't leak our, we didn't leak our tears in front of each other. Loved our weight quietly. We fissured, growing wild in our skins, walked home hungrier and more cutthroat. last poem is, it's another one of mine, um, and it's, it's called, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Gatorland in Orlando, but it's like the weirdest place in the world. <laughs> it's super bizarre. Um, basically, they have a bunch of alligators, and this is about that. <laughs> last year during midwinter break, my family and I went to Gatorland. Never had I been so close to something that could kill me so quickly. <laughs> Never have I stuck my fingers through the holes of fences into the same air these stupid monsters breathe. Never has something with such a large smile been so deadly. <laughs> Gator Lamb's Gatorland's claim to fame are the three leucistic white alligators found in its enclosed habitat. These are some of the rarest alligators in the world. They are bright white, like clean teeth, and their eyes are Superman blue, the color of ice mint chewing gum, the color of my sister's dresses. In the gift shop, I buy a small stuffed alligator with huge marble eyes whom I name Louie the Leucistic Alligator. He has cartoon teeth sticking out under his top lip and an evil grimace. My favorite one was named Kale, K-A-L-E, like the superfood. He weighed over 1,000 pounds and had a mouth the size of a small house. He could have swallowed me whole. I mean, not really because there were two layers of plexiglass between us and a small moat, but he could have, still, if he had really wanted to. <laughs> when Cal yawned, the entire world stops turning and looks down his throat. Into the red and pink swirl of darkness, I wonder how many things he could have killed and didn't. Cal is a lazy beast. The placard next to his habitat says that he likes lounging in the sun and playing with his girlfriend Matilda, and his, and his favorite food is raw beef, and that he lost the end of his tail in a fight with, hip, with a hippopotamus, so now there's just the stub at the end that looks kind of like one open eye. <laughs> We get to watch one of the trainers throw a bucket of bright red meat to Kale. Kale lifts up his tiny, tiny legs and wanders towards this pre-killed paradise. Kale is not an anxious creature. Why should you be when you are a 1,000 pound killing machine, when you got in a fight with a hippo and survived, when your girlfriend is the meanest crocodile in the whole zoo, when these tourists with their sunscreen covered faces and bold hands know that if you wanted to, you could take all their arms and turn them into ground meat, could make meat, could make them apologize, could swallow their heads in one kick swift. Swift kick. Since the 1970s, there have been less than 40 alligator or crocodile related deaths. This number seems far too low for creatures with that many teeth. 
When they smile, it's hard to tell if they are happy or ready to ki kill. Never have these monsters with their huge ballooning bellies and eyes that look like hard candy been so close to me. Never have I forgiven the slap of hardy green flesh on sunlight-covered stones. Never had I been so close to something that could kill me so quickly. Louis, the leucistic alligator, sits on my bookshelf next to my bed. His impossible smile rests steadily over me. His marble pupils just sit there, knowing that they could. Two open eyes. takes the metaphor of blue, as in blue feelings of sadness being blue, the color blue, the blues, music, and weaves them into a beautiful dedication. The whole poem reads like a long wailing guitar riff fading in and out, resonating. Please welcome Isaac. That's really cool. I didn't even think about the blues music thing. That's like... <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. Yeah, right. <laughs> credit, credit. <laughs> Um, this first poem is called Spring Car. Um, I usually write fairly long poems, but for this I decided that one's a little long, so I'd write it like a short, springy poem. Um, and so it's about my friend's car. We know, it's spring. we know when it's spring by the interior of Helen's car. It's like when we open the door to the red Saturn and sit down, and it smells really strange, like the spring air is crossed over the threshold, and it's now hot enough to mix with the vents and make an alienating smell. <laughs> And you feel the mustiness, but you don't care, because at least it means the air is wet. When she turns on the ignition, we don't have to cross our fingers for the engine, or wait for the pipe to rattle. And the vents blow hot air, and the windows don't need to defrost. She turns on her iPod, and we don't have to listen to music that will keep us warm. And the day's so new that the music has to be loud and muddled, because we want to let our minds roll. We glance to the back seat, and instead of the blankets and binders of December, there are scattered shades and sandals. She turns to me and says, let's go down to the water. And I know then that the grass is new, and that the animals are, are young, and that the air is clean. And it tells me that it's spring. Mm. Already blue strat now. This, this is the one. But, um, I like there's something I wanted to say. Mm. But yeah, so it's about this blue guitar that my friend has that um, made me think about my grandpa who passed away before I was born. When I play Eras Levin's blue Stratocaster guitar, I think about my Papa Ray. The Strat's got such good tone. It's a blue tone. It's palpable and deep, like Papa Ray's eyes in the pictures. And it echoes in my mind, like my dad's voice when he hears me play the guitar and says, your Papa would have loved you. It cries and bends, just like my brother at Christmas asking about regret and my father pensive, blinking. And he begins to let the wall down and says, my biggest regret is that Papa Rafe didn't know you. And I think to myself, that's a blue memory. The blue Strat guitar has two knobs, one for tone and one for volume. And when I play it, I like to turn both all the way up so I don't even need control. I just want it to ring. Like a deep cry, I want it to soak into my veins so I can feel its pulse. I like to tighten the guitar straps and make the blue Stratocaster rest real high up on my chest so my fingers can act ample and I can crack good sound out of the chords. Just like the memories that manifest when we ask my dad about Papa Rafe and his mind starts to turn and his strings start, start to change. And as he reaches deeper and deeper into his mind, into his blue eyes, the memories start to accumulate like snow that's been dirtied and driven and they rise and it chokes him up because they're real high in his chest. And he gets real teary-eyed when dreaming of Papa Rafe. His cracked throats can't let the cords hang. Papa Rafe's couldn't either, because they were cancer cords. But see, cancer cords aren't blue. They're foreign and petty, and they sink into your skin. And instead of that nice blue tone, cancer cords make a radioactive sound. It still rings. It's just shallow and thin. They're black cords. And when you strum the Strat guitar too hard, sometimes the neck pickup falls and you get the thin sound, a sound that doesn't reverberate. You get black chords. 
And so sometimes the leukemia owned Papa Wraith, and it made him strum too hard, and his sound would shrink and thin, and then he'd tug it back up like a lost livelihood, and then he, but then the pickup would fall and the cancer chords would return, and there he went from black tone to blue tone, thin to strong, cancer to healthy, black to blue, and he got tired of the fight. And so the cancer chords resonated. And they blackened Papa Rafe's blood, and they shaved his head, and they pummeled his brain, and he was dying. And my father took the train down to see him because he was dying. And he read him his dissertation, and he cried, Papa, look at my creation. He said, I'll fight your black chords with mine, with my blue chords. I'll read to you until you fall asleep. He said, my writing is in blue ink, and I'll recite it until your breath falls to the rhythm. My dad said that just before he died, Papa Rafe took two quick breaths, like the two knobs on the Stratocaster guitar. He turned them all the way up, and he let them ring, resonating those final breaths into the air so everyone in the room could feel what was left of his light blue life. So when I feel nostalgic, I pick up the blue Stratocaster guitar, and I let the chords ring. I push it high up on my chest to my heart, where the memories will hopefully fall once they reverberate. I push both knobs all the way up, so hopefully I'll be able to hear that ghostly deathbed two-breath echo. And the neck pickup will be turned on high, so the tone comes out blue. So if I'm being completely honest, I don't I don't like read a lot of page poetry. I, I like to write poetry, but I don't. Um, oh shit! I don't. Um, I don't uh, read that much of it. Um, so I was a little unclear. Uh, little I was a little uneasy about uh, what poem to use for this. Um, hang on one sec. I'm so sorry. Okay, marked down too fast. It's called uh, Tourists, and it's by this guy, Yehuda Amakai, who's one of my dad's favorite poets, who's an Israeli poet. Um, I'm so sorry. Oh, I got it. 333. <laughs> Don't let me forget that. Um, so yeah, this is one of my dad's favorite poets, and if, if he were here tonight, I, I honestly probably wouldn't read it, because it would be so cheesy, but he's not, so I, I figured it would be okay. Um, so this is Tourists by Yehuda Amakai. They come here to visit the mourners. They sit in Yad Vashem, or grave faces at the wailing wall, and laugh behind heavy curtains in hotel rooms. They take pictures with the important dead at Rachel's tomb, and at Herzl's tomb, and an, an ammunition hill. Weep for the beautiful heroism of our boys, lust for our tough girls, and hang their underwear for fast drying in a blue cold bathroom. Once I sat on the stairs at the gate of David's Tower and put two heavy baskets next to me. A group of tourists stood there around their guide and I served as their orientation point. You see that man with the baskets? A bit to the right of his head? There's an arch from the Roman period. A bit to the right of his head. But he moves, he moves. I said to myself, redemption will come only when they are told. You see over there, the arch from the Roman period? Never mind. But next to it, a bit to the left and lower, sits a man who bought, who bought fruits and vegetables for his home. familial history, rhetorical structures, and sound repetition to create a tone, tension, and a quality of feeling that climbs to a controlled emotional peak. I admire the way the poem's interrogatory moments punctuate the narrative while still inhabiting a lyrical space. Welcome, Sophia. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually going to read my uh, the poem that I didn't write. Um, and this is by Yusuf Komenyaka, who I um, was introduced to in my American Life class. Um, it's called Stalin. If he could blind his bodyguards, he would use a white-hot poker 
from a biblical story. With car lights off, they saw him kneel under a single star, definite as a bullet through a woman's pale breast. She left me as an enemy, he said a thousand times to that man in the moon who showed him how to tread footsteps Napoleon left. After prisoners worked ice, Routing a canal through an eternal white field of loneliness, he didn't want anyone to remember his hands trembled as he placed flowers on her snow-capped grave. Um, and then this one I actually wrote in the workshop today. Um, <laughs> It's called, Who Are You and Whom Do You Love? Which was, it was a poem based off um, like a series of questions and that was the first question that they asked. Second of four daughters, wavy haired, with mother's jawline, lips and cheekbones, father's eyes. Unremarkable and lost in a muddle of America reaching back to villages and mountains and bare feet walking to the sea. In order, in order to make a different life for babies you don't have, babies who will try to reach you three generations too late, who will try to understand how to be worthy of your life, who don't know what it means to be brave, to be empty, to unwrite a future already predetermined by the past, who try to fit themselves into your outline Wear your too thin shadow like a blanket. Take your name. Take the color of your father's eyes. Who reach for grandmother and try to understand two different kinds of absence. Try to understand that distance stems from fractures in the past. From those who remember fingernails in clotted dirt and rivers not wide enough to carry you away who couldn't speak loud enough to cover centuries or continents, whose secrets fester like invisible wounds in your blood, put there by those who made it easy to open eyes each morning unafraid, because of those who walked, who wished that edges in your blood wouldn't cut like glass. Um, and then this is called Barren to the Earth, and this is the one that was in the contest. When my father told me bedtime stories, he spoke in terms of miles traveled, distances lost or gained. He spoke of crumbled dirt against cracked heels, because it was important to remember every inch that had created my life had been covered by bare souls over the earth. In bedtime stories, I first learned how to worship grandparents who walked barefoot through lifetimes I could only reach in dreams. Great grandmother, my father told me how you left your sister in a potato field when you were young. You crouched low because around you, soldiers fired guns. You left your village alone and your sister never left at all, because America would only welcome immigrants who came unscarred. And your sister's blind eyes still bled as you left her ducking under bullets she could not see. You wouldn't have looked back as you walked farther and farther away, but each narrow gouge dug by your toe into the dirt would have rooted you to bullets and potato fields behind you. And after you were gone, I think your sister knelt and smoothed her fingers over every shallow gash like healing scars, attempting to absorb all trace of you so that only her hands would remember how to follow. She didn't know then how some footprints cannot be erased. Great grandmother, did you think of your sister later in 1933, when you spoke the word Holodomor and your entire country starved, did you think maybe she was buried then, among the millions in mass graves, 
swallowed by a hunger so large you almost believed your blood felt it too. Did you wonder whether her eyes closed then or after, when tanks rolled into your village and your home burned? As you laced leather shoes over clean white socks and toes, were you reminded that your sister was buried with bare feet covered in dirt? Did you remember the roots you lay so long ago? When you met your husband, he also spoke the language your sister still whispered to you in your dreams. And his feet remembered walking, calloused and bloodied, over mountains and continents to reach the ocean that had taken him to you. You loved him because his feet too remembered Ukraine and villages and siblings who burned. Great grandmother, I listen to news of your country, whose feet are still bare and cracked, whose mouth is still gaping in hunger, whose blind eyes are still forced to bleed. I will listen to your story. I will take it with me into my dreams. I will press my feet bare into the earth. graduate student readings, and you guys rock. Like, you're like matching or both those guys. Yeah. So just to know that. Um, our second place winner is Abby Lohr. Is that right? Lauer. No, Lauer. Okay. Um, this is what the judge said about her poem called Canning. The writer steps beautifully into the formal tradition here, writing not just a very fine sonnet, but also takes a traditional subject and stamps it with lively language and a musical ear in a distinct, stately voice. So please welcome that. I'm doing um, my winning poem first. Canning. My mother said she'd can me if she could. Pour vinegar, ferment my memory. Preserve me in a mason jar, she would. Take time to brine the fruit. Remember me. My family grows gardens on the farm. For years, they've planted, picked, and never yawned. Their mouths are strong. It's just part of the charm. My grandpa keeps us grounded, a strong bond. We leave no stone unturned up on the hill. Our food is ready just before the storm. My favorite kind of pickle, kosher dill. We'll eat out of the cellar and stay warm. But trapped inside that jar, I'll never be. I cannot be alone with family. <laughs> so this is my second poem, and it's about my parents and my family. The day you realize your parents are cool. <laughs> The day you realize your parents are cool is the day you look in your closet and find half your mother's wardrobe, now back in style, next to yours. You pull her L.L. Bean sweater over your head and go to school. The day you realize you love your mother, you are in poetry club and everyone is writing feverishly. At the end, we read an Ellen smile. My love for her fills the room, and the secret is out. The day you realize you love your father is when you finally value his life advice and college experiences. But most of all, you secretly find his dad jokes unbelievably funny, <laughs> instead of embarrassing and lame. The day you realize you want your parents as best friends, is the day you aren't afraid of being seen with them. You beg to third wheel on date night and have more fun with them than you would on an average Friday. 
You laugh when your dad buys an obscene amount of popcorn, and your mother shakes her head with disappointment, but later is overjoyed for the salty snack. The day you realize you hate being the only sister left is when you come home from school and find the house empty and quiet. You take your dog for a walk in the Abbott Woods, she tugs on her leash, hunting birds and squirrels, while you count down the days left in your head. May looms on the yellow calendar hanging in the kitchen. The day you realize you are creating an empty nest, you hug your parents tight and ask for money for a train ticket home. Mm -hmm. is by Gwendolyn Brooks. It's called Old Mary. Old Mary. My last defense is the present tense. It little hurts me now to know I shall not go. Cathedral hunting in Spain, nor cherrying in Michigan or Maine. our winner, I just want to thank Nicholas and I want to thank all of the teachers who are here because without you guys, we wouldn't have these great poets. So congratulations and thank you very much. I also want to thank Jihan Cho of Jihan Cho's Photography who's taking all these amazing pictures Yay! and videos. If you want to see some beautiful photos, go on our website. Um, and also go on his website, Gian Cho Photography, he's really amazing. Um, and he does everything for free for us, which is great. Um, I also want to thank Community High and um, Ellen Stone in particular, who is just such an amazing helper at Wolfen Pops. Which leads me to another weepy thank you, which is to our winner, Emma Radza, who is um, a one pause intern. She's been a one pause intern for the last year. The, the judging was blind. Uh, Susan had no idea that Emma was a one pause intern. And she does an amazing amount of work for us. She's always the first one to show up at a reading to help set up chairs and make sandbag lanterns. And she's always the last one in the dark walking around with me with a flashlight looking for stuff that's been left on the ground out at the farm. So I'm just really grateful to you, Emma, just for that. But also, she is an amazing poet who won our first place contest. <laughs> um, so, I just want to read what the judge wrote about Emma's poem, Elegy for Me, for You. With confidence and maturity, Rod Seth's language lovingly crafts little bursts of music in this poem, using phrases that collide, hover, and gallop with admirable pacing and control. Her language is unusual and interesting, her turns of phrase are certain and elegant, and her quiet voice is one I hope we'll hear more often, a fine poem. Thrashing wildly to get free. They said it could just be conserving energy, 
But the men above give the verdict, finish untangling, and let the bird fall. There's a stiff thump in a puff of feathers. My aunt, my aunt gasps as though they've just dropped her dignity. I stare at the creature's resigned eyelids. Buzzing flies encroach eagerly, the hook and nylon cord still lodged down the heron's throat from whatever fish it last ate, along with the hook, perhaps the fish thinking the fisherman was offering. How could it have flown? How did it breathe? How did it feel to fall out of the sky? The feathery body is placed in a cardboard box. The line will have, the line will have to be removed so some scavenger won't swallow it while feeding. I wonder how long it will be before we catch our own disease. I think of hooks and angling and how I've made colored paper cranes to hang by windows. Nimble fingers and string, it's roughly the same thing. In the car, I feel tired. I want to sleep somewhere that feels like home. But I'm not sure there is such thing outside the chattering of civilization and belongings. I want to lay back in the trees until the inhales stop hurting my skull, the exhales stop poking my ribs. My wrists are small. They faithfully arrest each fall I take. They contain weak salmon bones or perhaps hollow wing structures. Certainly good reflexes and a tolerance for sprains. I wonder what it would be like for them to finally snap. Or better yet, for the bow to stop bending and just break beneath my bed. As, as I was always told it would in the wind. My aunt slides into the driver's seat and meets my blurry glassy-eyed gaze with some sentimental remark before starting the car. I think I hear white noise, but the radio is off. I guess I didn't have the heart to tell her that I'd only yawned. two years ago at the rock pool where you sat and played the jeweler with all those stones you'd stolen from the shore. Most of them went dark and nothing more. But sometimes one would blink the secret color it had locked up somewhere in its stony sleep. This is how you knew the ones to keep. So I collect the dull things of the day in which I see some possibility, but which are dead and which have the surprise I don't know, and I've no pool to help me tell. So I look at them and look at them until one thing makes a mirror in my eyes that I paint it with a tear to make it bright. This is why I sit up through the night. Trying to trade typos, chasing winking cursors that chanted the word I, I think I mistakenly served you my youth and stunted sips at that kid you knew. Today, if I could like to look to, <laughs> sorry, today if I could learn to like looking back at my own voice, and if you chose to finally grow, I would tell you everything. Because if I said I'd been a fraud, I'd have to go on. Explain first that I am breathing, yet more endangered with each breath. Next, how I got here. How the pretty prints fell from their tacks, and I woke to a curved paper hardwood crash in the dark. Midnight restart my heart attack. Lurch forward, greeted by glass, past the famous, past the favorites. Windows where true stars confessed that there was no how to getting here, but a how to how long. One can stay folded into blindness. Knees tucked underneath, Head rebreathing heavy air before clarity's well intentioned tap on the shoulder, the natural enemy of any dreamy, discreet reality. I would tell you everything because a now so called sick brain works cyclically enough to know that at the tips of veins, the V's tip together and circuits are seen. 
The secret was always there, but if everyone was only ever a pair of capital I sockets, pressed sideways to field views of layered figure eights, we just keep slipping on microscope slides, telescopes, ice, and each other. I would tell you everything because if, in an attempt to redeem, I spoke of your 100 years piano keys, I'd have to mention the 100 pages of me I pit with keys lit from beneath. I type to stay sane on the ice. You furtively sane. You used to tell me everything. If we talked about the ice, I'd have to toss underhand. Something less bundled up, like the sentimental, undisguised sense of an old blue season, and melting, and how people can melt people too. Well, for me, just you. See, if I gave someone a branch, it would take a forest fire to feel free. But you are not the burning. You are the flame, and with care, I still carry you with me. I am a forged teepee assembled in the dark, too much to say and eager to fall apart. You have nothing to do with me, which is why, I think, I still crave your heat. You know nothing of these veins, but I brought them anyway to slip you this note. I cannot say all that I actually wrote, so I spoke to my flame, who, with a soundless half-smile, will wave, looking a bit long gone, looking just past the eyes of little kid loss. Cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you.